So my, my solar eclipse viewing glasses arrived the other day. They're pretty boss. I can't see any of you right now, but I can feel what you're thinking. <laughs> and if I'm correct, you're thinking with great jealous admiration. <laughs> when I got these, I put them on and I went outside and I looked up at the sun. And I was just amazed. I had never seen that big orange fireball like that before. I was able to look at it for an extended period of time and really gaze upon it and ponder it and it, you know, imagine it being 93 million miles away but yet seeming so close that it touches our lives. We, I mean, we bask in it every day. And then when I took, when I took the glasses off again, it was as though the sun was brilliant anew. It was, it was as though I were experiencing it again. And, and I was completely blown away as I was thinking about the, all of the light and color and heat and life made possible by this sun. And I imagine that this is a bit of what those apostles would have experienced on that mountain, Peter, James, and John, that they must have been blown away anew with this vision of Jesus they didn't have before. And that, that led me to ponder a bit on who was really transfigured on the mountain. Was it Jesus or was it the vision of Peter, James, and John were, were the dark lenses removed from their eyes so that they were able to see Christ's true nature for the first time. Because when I thought about it, Jesus really didn't keep his identity a secret. He shined forth with the radiant brilliance of God everywhere he went, with every person that he encountered. He shared himself authentically, openly with everybody. There was no secret. But few people saw him for who he truly was. Very few. Because they had their own vision shaded by prejudice and expectation. I mean, he was a hick from the backwaters of Nazareth. He spoke this very unsophisticated Aramaic dialect. Surely that can't be the Son of God. Surely that can't be the Messiah, the anointed one we've been waiting for. He's so uncouth, unpolished. And and they had expectation. They knew what the Messiah was supposed to look like. The Christ, the anointed one. Oh my gosh. He was going to be a king like David. All buff with a square jaw, riding in on a white horse and reuniting the tribes of Israel and, and freeing the Jews from the Roman overlords. And this guy was this humble servant who was born in a barn and only talked about freeing people from fear and death. Surely this couldn't be what God looks like. Of course, then we must reflect on ourselves. Do we walk around with blinders on? How come we've never experienced the radiant brilliance of God this way? We, know, we believe a couple of things. We believe a lot of things, but two in particular. We believe that every human person is created in the image and likeness of God. Everyone. And we believe that Christ dwells in the human heart. 
So if those things are true, if God is everywhere, and every person we encounter is created in God's image and likeness, and Christ dwells in our hearts, and in the hearts of everyone else, then how come we've never experienced that brilliant radiance of God's presence among us? Or have we? But we haven't recognized it. And have we not recognized it because we're walking around with our own dark lenses of prejudice and expectation? Every time we look at another person and have that shadow voice within us, think in terms of what that person ought to be like. She ought to be a little thinner. They ought to speak English like we do. That family ought not be using food stamps. Every time we impose that on another person, we are in effect putting a lens, a dark lens, over them and stopping ourselves from seeing and experience their true, divine, Christ-like nature. And we do it to ourselves, too. Every time, every time we hear ourselves saying, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not wealthy enough. We're closing down our own true divine nature. As though somehow God got it wrong. And then we're not allowing other people to see it radiate from us. In 1973, the Stanford psychologist David Rosenhan conducted what is now a very famous experiment. He and seven of his students got themselves admitted to 12 different psychiatric hospitals. And once there, once they were admitted, they acted completely normally and reported to staff that they felt fine and experienced no symptoms. And yet they were held for an average of 19 days, one person for two months. And all but one of them, all but one of them was diagnosed as schizophrenic before they were allowed to leave. And among the many things that, that this experiment shows us it, is it affirms how we have a tendency to see in others what we're looking for in others. So when we go out in the world and we look for people's faults and failings, we find and see faults and failings. When we go out and we encounter others and we look for reasons to believe that they're somehow socially or morally inferior to us and we're socially, morally superior to them. That's what we find when we look through those dark lenses. We don't see the light. But what happens if we go into the world and we look at each person and we look for their true Christ-like divine nature? And we look for their giftedness, and we look for the love they have to share and the love they're hoping to receive. What happens if we take the dark lenses off and we look for the radiant brilliance of Christ in every single person? Why? The whole world would be transfigured.